So just so you know, I think I can do something else here. I'll try to show you what we're doing here. See that drop right there? You got a little nice bit of bait. Candy. Everybody likes sugar, right? Not really. Everybody likes some candy. There you go. Go ahead and just throw some of this over here. Kind of get it a little concentrated in that area. You just throw one right up under here. Like that. There you go. Coming, man. Ah. Coming. Coming. Yeah, I'm waiting for you. It's going to be oh so good. There you go. The Lord gave me that message last week. We'll get into that a little bit more. Whenever uh, whenever she was uh, preaching, the Lord showed me. It was the most interesting thing. I think I might have mentioned it to you. Actually, I was sitting up here, and we were worshiping the Lord, and then Angie got up to get ready to preach, and she started talking about something, and she had not even turned to the passage of Scripture yet, but it was something that she said, and all of a sudden, because you see, I've preached, I've talked about this concept on a few occasions, so it's very, uh, I'm very aware of it in my mind, and anyway, I started to imagine this passage out of Psalm 91, we're about to read the verses here in a moment, but I was... I was imagining the whole thing and I got to the point about the snare of the fowler and I imagined this whole, cause I've always talked to y'all about this. I don't know if you remember or not, but it's a story that I tell that when I used to go visit at my sister's house in the park over there in Lawrence park, it was full of pigeons and I would go out there and I tried to set this silly little <laughs> thing up trying to catch pigeons. One, I caught one bird one time and, but, and I would put like some little seed and whatnot. And while I was sitting there thinking about all of this, I was actually saying, you know, one day I need to do, preach this. I felt like the Lord was telling me to preach it today, and, and, and I needed to set all this up. Anyway, next thing you know, she says, turn to Psalm 91. And I'm telling you right now, and so I knew that the Lord wanted me to talk to you about this this morning. So we're going to read Psalm 91, and we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 11. I think I'm going to pick this up for you a little bit to where you can see it. It says, he that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And look, just so that we kind of clear on this, let's look at another translation. For it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. Shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. You know, a noisome pestilence is something that smells bad, and a pestilence is like a plague. It, noisome sounds like it would mean sound, but noisome means smell, and it has to do with the olfactory senses, okay? And listen, whenever a pestilence starts to strike people and there's a whole lot of death and dying, things start smelling real bad real quick. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your hand, eyes <clears throat> shall, the, shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. In all your ways. And so real quick, I just wanted to, to share with you again, the main verse that I'm using this morning <clears throat> is verse number three, where it says that he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your word. Lord, your word is glorious. Your word gives us wisdom and direction, oh Lord God. And we just pray, 
Holy Spirit, that you would speak this morning, Lord, that you would do what only you can do, Lord. As a man, Lord, called by you to speak your word, we're just simply vessels. That's all we are. We're just mouthpieces that you've called, Lord. And you've given us a great calling, oh Lord God, to be a mouthpiece for the Most High God, because this is how you have chosen to communicate with humanity, Lord, through human language. And I pray, Lord, that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that you would communicate to your people that are called by your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, pray, you know, <clears throat> uh, when I was young, this is another little story. When I was young, there was a place that I would go. It was, I would call it the farm, and uh, it was in Lafayette. It was actually in this near Oakhorn Country Club, but it was on the other side of the Vermilion River, and it was a swampland where this friend of mine, his dad, had had uh, leased this land, and it was like I don't even remember how many, but it was a lot of acreage, and 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 they could flood the acreage and turn it into a crawfish farm. And so there was all kind of wildlife out there, and we would go, they had it, they, we, no, we called it the camp, that's what it was, and there was like an old shack out there, <clears throat> and he'd just drop us off and leave us there. I mean, it, I mean there, there's so many stories I could tell you about all that. That was a mess. But anyway, because we were like 13, and there, was a, and there would be these older men that would come in and help him do different things, and I remember this one man lived, literally lived off the land, and he would, he would set traps, animal traps, and many of you probably are familiar with animal traps. They come in various sizes, and you spring the trap. It's like a metal device, and the, and it and it camouflage it, and and the animal doesn't know, and it's usually chained to a tree or in some way, you know, it's connected to a tree so they can't drag it off. And there's ones for smaller animals, and there's ones for bigger animals. They can be as big as a bear trap. And 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 so I can remember one time though that he had been setting his traps, and and we happened upon one where he, where a raccoon got caught in it. And I can tell you that a raccoon that's caught in a trap, this thing was not happy. I mean, this thing was very aggressive and, and very angry, you know, with the situation that he had found himself in. And I got to tell you that through the years, I've thought about that raccoon and how mad it was and how bitter it was and how angry and how it just wanted to really uh, <coughs> lash back out at someone. And I thought about the fact, too, that how easy it would be for somebody just kind of minding their own business walking through the woods or even maybe a domesticated animal walking through the woods minding their own business and all of a sudden their paw or their foot gets caught in the trap and you know it's kind of difficult at some point in time you know Robert well I'm not going to get into that Robert told us a story about his brother this morning and how he got trapped under a truck and he literally was able to jack it up with his foot um, that was pretty amazing in and of itself but at the same time if you're caught in a trap in the woods and you can't get out I would imagine at some point in time you would get frustrated. You're, you're stuck there and you need somebody to come over there and to help. Can you imagine the isolation? Have you ever been even stuck in the wood? And about whenever it's about to get dark and the mosquitoes start coming? I mean, as a man, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm not a big hunter. I'm really not. But I've been in the woods before and I've been in the woods later than I should have been. And Lord knows, I can't even find my way from here to Amelia in a car. And so help me if I'm in the woods because I definitely will not know how how to, how to get out of it, right? And, uh, and it's a mess is all I'm trying to say. You get separated out from civilization. You get isolated, you know? I want you to know that, uh, that that's what the enemy wants to do to you and I. He wants to ensnare us. I entitled this morning's message, Tricky Traps, because the enemy, he's tricky, and he wants to set a trap, amen? He wants to get us. And, you know, he wants to get us to a place where we're isolated, and we'll start blaming everybody else. Did you hear me? <laughs> we'll start blaming everybody else. Yep. Look, it's easy to blame other people. It's right. easy to blame your mom and your daddy. It's easy to blame your children. It's easy to blame your spouse. It's sure enough easy to blame the preacher. Preacher don't ever do nothing. Right. Okay? I'm just saying, really. I mean, people just don't do but, but if we're honest with one another, nobody really does what they're supposed to do most of the time. Amen. Lord knows I try. Lord, give me grace. I want to do what's right. But if we're honest with one another and we're willing to look in the mirror, we can admit to ourselves that, you know what, we're not always doing the right thing. And the enemy wants to get us in a place where he traps us, he isolates us, and he begins to cause us to become angry and bitter and unhappy, and we'll start displacing. I'm not trying to use psychological terms. I don't even like psychology, but that's what they call it, displacement. I want to displace my frustrations on someone else. Yeah. It's never my fault. Isn't that, you ever known somebody that was on drugs real bad? Or you ever been on drugs real bad in the past? It, oh, I ain't never know. It's everybody else. It's always something else. Something else called, no, no, sir, no, ma'am. It's not everybody else. A lot of times you allowed yourself 
to get caught in the trap. And now that you're in the trap, you don't like it and you want to get out. Hey, praise the Lord. God will deliver us out from the snare of the fowler. That's what the word of the Lord says. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So the snare of the fowler is, is that way. The enemy desires to entrap humans in sin and isolate them. And he wants people hopeless and bitter towards God. But God is a deliverer. Amen. In that same 11 verses that we read, it, it, it described God or, or things connected to God. The secret place. The shadow of the Almighty. He is our refuge and our fortress. He will cover you with his wings. He will be to you a shield and a buckler. A shield is a big shield. A buckler is a small shield. God is our refuge and our strength. He is our tower. He is our fortress. You know, this psalm was used throughout Israel's history. And I don't know if you remember the story of Ruth or not, but you know, Ruth ends up marrying Boaz, but the first time she finds herself uh, in his field, um, you know, the, when, and she realizes the blessings that Boaz is pouring upon her, and she's just overwhelmed with the goodness, and you know what Boaz, see, because Ruth was a Moabite, what does that mean? She, she wasn't a child of God. She was raised in another neighborhood, if you could say it like that. She was raised in another area where they didn't know the people of God. They worshiped false gods. It's kind of like the people out there in the world. They just don't know God. And you and I aren't supposed to be that way because we know the Lord. Amen. But she didn't know God. But guess what? She started to learn of God through her mother-in-law. And then they end up coming back to Israel. And then she finds herself in Boaz's field. And he's blessing her. She's reaping the edges of his field because it's harvest time because they don't have anything. It's kind of like a long story. But when she realizes that he's blessing her, she's overwhelmed with the goodness and she doesn't understand it. And so she questions him. He says, that's because you, you brought yourself under the wings of the God of Israel. See, you made a choice. You chose to serve the God of Israel. Because see, when they were back in Moab, which, which her in-laws weren't supposed to be there to begin with, but it's a long story. Whenever his, her mother-in-law, Naomi, heard there was bread back in Jerusalem, and that's a beautiful thing because the name Jerusalem means the house of bread. Bethlehem, I'm sorry, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Then she said she was going back, and one of the sister-in-law said, I'm going to stay here. But Ruth said, no, your God's going to be my God. Your home is going to be my home. And she followed her mother-in-law back over there, and Boaz let her know, no, you, you made a choice. You, you made a choice to make the God of Israel your God, and now you have positioned yourself under the shadow of his wings and this is part of it god is here to bless you and so that's the, that's what i wanted to remind you that there is a secret place i didn't i didn't plan on saying this but i want you to know that many times i would read in the old testament and i would say where is that secret place lord where is that cleft in the rock that you hid moses whenever you allowed your glory to pass where is that lord where is that place for the for the child of god to dwell and i'm here to tell you this morning that god made a perfect place for you to dwell. God made a per and that secret place is in Christ. It's a place of faith. It's not a, a it's not a, a physical thing that you'll ever crawl into like David did when he was on the run, but it's a secret place called in Christ. And you learning how to allow Jesus and what he's already accomplished for you to be the object of your faith. Not not the right words that you say, not 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 the, the things that you do for the church. No, the things that he did, the thing he did for you, which allowed you to be a partaker of his righteousness, which allows God the Father to accept you based upon the agreement or the covenant that God made. See, people sometimes we get tired. We get tired of hearing the same old thing, but you not, I never want to grow tired of hearing the truth of the word. That God bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. His name was Jesus, amen. All for the purpose for dying on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. And listen, it doesn't just start, oh, I've been on the cross, preacher. Look, I went to a church a long time ago. We need you to write us some Sunday school material. I write, I pour out, write the Sunday school material. Oh, this is easy stuff. That's what one of the brothers said. This is easy stuff. We, we need to get past that. You know what it was? He was bound up in the word of faith. He, he could not see that the name it and claim it, the grab it and blab it was actually putting faith in their positive confession. 
They now had changed the object of their faith from what the word of God has clearly stated from the beginning of time when he said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent all the way to revelation in the end when he still bears the nail scars in his hand because the word of God calls him the lamb. Amen. From the beginning to the end, he is the lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the earth. So it's not just when you first believe. No, this is how you continue to believe. Colossians 2 and 6. The same way you received him. How did you receive him, church? Through faith. Through faith in what? Through faith in the fact that you were a sinner and you needed a savior. And if you hadn't got there yet, then you might not be saved yet. You got to come to the realization that you are a sinner born of Adam. Hallelujah. But God made a way to give you Jesus so that you could be born again. Amen. And so I wrote the Sunday school. He's like, man, this is easy stuff. We need to move on past this. See, people completely misunderstand Hebrews 6. Where it talks about leaving the elementary principles of Christ. They think Christ is his last name or something. No, Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. Yeah. The Old Testament spoke of the Christ. The leaving the elementary principles of the Christ means that we leave the washings of the Old Testament, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, that we're moving past that, getting to the fulfillment of these types and shadows. Completely missing it. They think, right. oh, the cross is old news. No, the cross is never old news. The cross yeah. is relevant to, for today. Because let me tell you what the cross does for you, my friend. It puts you to death. Yeah. Oh, uh, come on. Now the preacher's preaching a whole lot better than what we're amen. And it puts you to death. It puts me to death. It puts my flesh to death. It puts my desires to death. All those things that stand in the front against the face of God and say, no, Matt will live. No, Matt must die. Like John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. Yes, that's the word of the Lord. Right. See, we're in simple. That's what he said. This is just too simple. But what was sad, and I didn't know, so I would get all of my feathers all ruffled up. Because man <laughs> wasn't wanting to die. <laughs> and I said, say, well, I said it in front of I said, well, if it's so dumb on simple, why can't nobody do it? Right. Well, 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 I mean, nobody's living a crucified life, sir. Everybody's, everybody's looking out for themselves. Everybody's selfish and they put others below. And the word of God says, prefer your brother greater than yourself in the book of Philippians. <clears throat> you know, that all has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and care more about you than I care about myself. But if the Holy Spirit's working in me, I'm going to at least care enough about you that I don't do make a decision that benefits me but hurts you. Does that make sense? That's yeah. right. No, sometimes we can't even think past where we are in life. And we're just so consumed and worried about our own selves. Yeah. Uh, Lord help us is all I'm trying to say. Amen. So he is the secret place. Praise God. He is the shadow. He is the refuge and the fortress. He will cover you with his wings. He will be your shield and your buckler. But verse 9 said this. Because you have made the Lord your refuge. I want to. I wanna, because see Ruth had made the Lord her refuge. When a person makes the decision to make the Lord their refuge, what does that sound like to you? What does that look like to you? I guess we could all have different opinions on that. You know, the Lord's really been hammering home to me at least for a year now. It's a whole lot. There's a big difference between believing that God is real. There's a big difference even between loving God and serving God. Yep. You hear what I'm trying to say? Yep. You can say you love God. You can say you believe God. But the reality of it is, is this, is that all, and all that's good and all that's important and all those are first steps in moving in the right direction, but that is not necessarily serving God. See, the word of God is clear. The word of God is clear and the people that are called by his name are supposed to be separate and distinct from the world. Amen. It's very clear. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, that's the whole purpose of the law and that was the whole purpose of the circumcision. Was so that they were separated and distinct and different than the world around them. I'll give you two examples. The book of Deuteronomy stated that whenever I bring you into the new land and the people see you, they're going to question and they're going to say, when they see you walking according to my statutes and my judgments, which is an Old Testament version of the word of God, they're going to say, what other people is there that have their God so close to them? It's going to be recognizable when you live your life according to my my word is going to be recognizable to the people around you, to the world around you, that you're not the same as they are. 
But we can come to church uh, two times a week, three times a week, and we can get involved in ministry. And whenever the doors are closed and we're walking back outside and we're around the world and we act just like they do, we talk just like they do, we go where they go and we partake of them, then we're no longer living a separated life. And I am sorry, but I'm not really sorry if this message doesn't sound like a message somewhere else that people like that tickles their ears. The reality of it is, because I'm, I'm preaching to the preacher, the reality, this is God's word. And God's word is all always demanded that his people be separate. He's not asking us to do it on our own. He's not asking us to do it on our own. He provided Jesus so that continued faith in him will allow grace to be released into our life to give us an inner strength that's more powerful than the power of sin. That's more powerful than the, than the temptations of the world. And he will strengthen us in order to be able to walk with him and to bring him glory so that we can serve the Lord. Yes. I want to be in a place in my life where I no longer am concerned about what other people think about me. Yeah, amen. Amen. Why would I want to be concerned about what the world thinks about me? Am I convinced that God is real? Am I convinced that Jesus is the way? Because if I am, they need it. They need it so bad. They're hurting and they're dying and they're trapped and they're in the wilderness. And the mosquitoes are about to descend on them because it's getting dark real quick. And they need somebody to be able to live it. They need somebody to be able to tell them. So I want to encourage you, Christian. Amen. Let us come to the place where we would, where we would serve him. Amen? Amen. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge. You have made the Lord God your refuge. You made a choice to serve him. Amen? Amen. You know, I want to know, I want you to know that the trap only works if it isn't seen. The trap only works if it isn't seen. Psalm 119, 105 says this, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of the Lord brings light to the pathway that God wants his people to walk. The word of God lightens the path so that we can clearly see and so that the traps along the way can be seen and avoided. The trap is sprung on the unsuspecting and spiritual traps begin with a distortion or a hiding of God's word. Let me say that again. Spiritual traps begin with a distortion or a hiding of the word of the Lord. Let's compare a couple of scriptures real quick. Again, I just want us to go ahead and stay right here in this psalm. Psalm 91, verse 11. Look at this. I want, you to, I want us to read this together. This is the psalm we just read. For he, talking about God, shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Now, real quick, I want to bring you to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. We're talking about a distortion or a hiding of the word of the Lord. This is Satan speaking here. And who's he talking to? He's talking to our Lord. He's talking to Jesus. He says unto him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. So he quotes the very psalm in verse 11 that we just read from to Jesus. To try to tempt him or to test him, to get him to step outside of the Father's will, to perform his own will, to bring glory on himself. That's what the enemy is trying to do. And let me tell you that in the same way that, it, that Jesus was tempted of the enemy, you and I will always be tempted of the enemy in the same way. There's a lot to this. We could sit here and probably talk about this. If we had a round table, we could sit down and talk about this literally for an hour. But what I want you to know is this. The way that the enemy tried to test Jesus in this aspect was he was trying to get Jesus to step outside of his humanity and to act according to his deity. It was not God's will for him to do. God's will for Jesus, and I hope you can understand this and that you don't walk out of here misunderstanding something and thinking the wrong thing. God's will for Jesus was for Jesus to, to be the last Adam. The second Adam to make right what the first Adam made wrong. God the Father's will was for Jesus to be tempted in human flesh and to do it right. And then to offer that perfect life as a sacrifice. Right. God the Father's will was not for Jesus to manifest his deity one day and then to vacillate back to his humanity the next. No. Jesus was always deity. He never stopped being deity. He is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But his purpose on earth was to make right what Adam made wrong. 
The enemy of his soul, the enemy of your soul, is trying to get him to step outside of the Father's will and to go according to his own will. Even in the garden, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. You and I will be tempted in the same way every day of our lives. The enemy is trying to get you and I to step outside of the Father's will and to move in our own will. Every test, every trap, every tricky trap is going to be an attempt to do that, no matter how small or how big. For you to step outside of your will. We don't have, I don't care, I can't wait on God. Okay, Saul. <laughs> Take matters into your own hands then and just go ahead and offer up your own sacrifice. I don't have the time and the patience to wait on the Lord. No, we need to learn how to wait on the Lord. I don't know if I really like God's will. Okay, then I guess that we're just not going to serve the Lord and we're going to just serve ourselves. This is just truth right here. <laughs> I didn't make it up. It's in his word. If you read it all enough and you study enough, you know that what I'm telling you is the truth. Because a lot of times the truth goes against our flesh. That's right. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, when somebody is speaking truth and our flesh gets ruffled, it's probably because our flesh is trying to fight. I know it happens to me. Sometimes I'm reading and then my flesh gets ruffled. And the Lord will say, son, that's my word. You called to be a preacher of my word. What are you going to do? You going to pretend you didn't see that? He says unto him, it is written that he will give his angels charge over you. This is a classic example of how Satan and false teachers twist the word of God, causing people that genuinely want to know God to become deceived and then frustrated when it doesn't happen the way they expect. Right here. Je listen, let's listen, think about Jesus for a second. He knew the word of God. Amen? Jesus, Jesus was the word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Amen? Amen. Revelation 19, 13, he's clothed in a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. He knew the Word. And he knew Psalm 91 very well. And, and this is, and, but he also knew the Father's will surpasses the will of everything else. He knew that God would charge his angels to take care of Jesus. As a matter of fact, God sent the angels to minister to Jesus after he was tempted in the wilderness, after this happened. But it's all about God's timing, and it's all about God's purpose, and it's all about God's will. And Jesus understood that God the Father had a perfect will. And just because a scripture is quoted a certain way doesn't mean that it's actually being utilized in the way that God originally intended it. There's preachers all across America standing behind pulpits right now as you and I are, are sitting here listening to the word of God that are, that are presenting the word of God. They're using scriptures, but they're being taken out of context and they are no longer communicating the word of God because right. it's out of context. It's out of God's will. Now, what are you saying? Are you the only one? Of that course, that's not what I'm saying. And most of, those, most of these guys that are doing that don't even realize that they're doing it. Most of these guys that do that have been taught by someone else before them out of context. There are, are there some that do it on purpose? Absolutely. It's all about a tricky trap. Yep. And there's a distortion of God's word because sometimes men do it for evil gain. Yes. Jesus knew the word. He knew Psalm 91, but he also knew the Father's will surpasses the will of everything else. Look at, um, look at 1 Peter chapter 5, <coughs> verse 8. 1 Peter 5. Verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. That word, the word sober, is a lot, the word sober is a lot different spiritually than the way that we would imagine, Right? Sober, vigilant, it means to be watchful and awake. Watchfulness and wakefulness means something very specific according to this passage than the normal use of the words. Watchfulness, wakefulness, sobriety. See, whenever you're drunk, when a person is drunk, they can't see right, they can't hear right, they don't really know where they're going. I mean, your level of drunkenness might look different than mine used to look, but what I'm trying to say is most of the time I don't even know how I ended up where, where I, how did I get here the next day? Because I couldn't see right, I couldn't think right, I couldn't hear right, and I didn't have a compass, and I was just going off wandering somewhere where I had no business being. The Lord's saying, spiritually speaking, you need to be watchful and awake. 
And it doesn't have to be alcohol or drugs that cause the confusion. It can be a lust for anything else, a desire for anything else. It can be a desire that I got to watch the saints so bad this afternoon that I'm not focused on anything else. You get, this, you get the point that I'm trying to make. I'm so caught up in football and fantasy football, or I'm so caught up in going to the gym. I'm so caught up in, in life. I'm so caught up in material possessions. I'm so caught up in, what, in work. I'm so caught up in whatever that I'm not watchful and awake. I'm not sober spiritually understanding that the enemy is trying to set a tricky trap. He's trying to bait me. The enemy will never stop. He's trying to get you. He wants to isolate you. He wants to trap you. Listen, I'm talking about your individual life this morning. Right now, I'm talking about your individual life. The enemy has a scheme planned. The enemy has a piece of candy. And he's throwing it over there. To prepare the trap in your individual life. But can I tell you something? We've been talking about end times a lot. We've been in the book of Daniel. We've been in the book of Revelation. Can I tell you something? That the enemy is scheming right now globally. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm here to tell you. That's, right. well, that's not what I'm preaching about, but I'm one more than a Christian. I'm warning you. The enemy is scheming a plan, he's setting a tricky trap. And if you think that the true believers are not going to take, the, there's not going to be the possibility that they don't get snared, you and I are wrong if we think that. There's, there's, there's believers that are having to take a stand for the Lord in other countries right now as we speak. And I'm here to tell you, all I'm trying to tell you is be sober. That's all I'm really trying to say. Even if my, even if my mindset of some things don't agree with your mindset on, that's fine. Be sober. Be spiritually awake. Be watchful and awake. Be prepared. Don't believe everything that you see. <laughs> believe the word of the Lord. Amen. Yeah, that's right. The second thing is that his traps and trickery, his traps and trickery are intelligent and methodical. I want you to know that there's a plan. You know, I know I've said this before, but there's an old song by the Rolling Stones, and I'm not, I'm not preaching the stones because I'm, you know, come on, man, that's straight up demonic devil worship right there. And it, whether you realize it or not, it is. And I'm gonna tell you right now, they wrote a song. It's called Ode to Satan. And the whole song is about Satan's trickery and traps. Mm. And, and he says, I was there. I made Pontius Pilate wash his hands. Mm. So what I want you to understand is, is that in the song, and, 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 how does that song go? And I, I don't mean to sing it, but you'll, you'll get it whenever it's used on the Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> Did you get my name? Du, du, du. That's the song. What's bothering you is the nature of my game. See, that's what's bothering you is the nature of my game because I set a trap and I put the bait and it looked good and it tasted good and it smelled good and it looked real sweet. And, it, and your naive mind thought that it was okay to continue to forge on and to sit here and nibble around for a little bit. That's what's bothering you is the nature of our game. Because I present myself as an angel of light. And my ministers present themselves as an angel of light. And it looks so clear. And it looks so beautiful. And how could this even be harmful? And just get a little bit closer. That's what's bothering you is the nature of my game. I made Pontius Pilate. I was there. I watched him wash his hands. This thing's been here a whole lot longer than you, my friend. He's a whole lot smarter than Einstein. He's been observing human behavior for a long time. He knows how to get mankind and where he wants to get them. And he's been watching you. <laughs> he's been watching you closer than you probably watch yourself. And he knows. And he knows how to set a trap. He knows how to set that bait. And that's what Ephesians 6.11 says. Ephesians 6.11 says... Put on the whole armor of God, which is Jesus. We're not going to break that down right now. That's Jesus. Come on. Jesus is the helmet of your salvation. Jesus is the shield of your faith. Jesus is the sword of the spirit. I can give you scripture for all this. Jesus is the truth that loins and girth about your loins. Jesus is the armor of God. Hallelujah. When the apostle Paul sat in that Roman prison and looked at that centurion and the Holy Spirit moved upon him to write, that's what he was seeing. He was seeing a soldier dressed in Jesus. Ready for battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The methodia of the devil. To lie in wait, deceitful trickery. The snare was a trapping device that used bait and trickery to entrap foul. And there it is. There it is right there. The, the, the snare. I know I already tried to show you the picture earlier. 
And that's what he that's what he does. He puts he put you know you never want to put you never want to put too much up here right away. You know what I'm saying? You want to kind of like spread it out a little bit. And and because 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 if you if you make it too obvious, if you don't camouflage it at all and you put it all right there, the little bird brain, he's gonna probably realize what's going on. That's why they call it a bird brain, right? right. I mean, at least me, I was trying to catch them pigeons in the park, and it's like they knew what I was doing. They looked at me like, come on, dude, really? One day I got one, though. But I'm just trying to say, like, you don't put, see, what you do is you kind of, like, spread it out a little bit, you see? And it doesn't look that harmful. It looks good, and it's sweet, and you kind of get them distracted. Right. You know, just kind of, like, moseying around. No, well, this is safe. This is pretty safe. But then the next thing you know, you kind of start getting a little bit closer, and you start feeding in this area over here for a while, you start getting kind of comfy. See? That's it. Yeah, that's what happens. You're getting a little bit comfy. You're used to you're used to living kind of close to the edge. And, and, and then the next thing you know, you get in there, and there he is. He's waiting. He's waiting, and oh, he says the trap. And there you are. You're stuck just like that raccoon in the woods. Right. right. Stuck just like that raccoon in the woods, and you can't get out. And now you're so aggressive and you become isolated and you get so angry, right? And who are we going to be angry with? What we said earlier, oh, it's, the, it's my spouse's fault. It's my mama's fault. It's my daughter's fault. Why did she have to go off and do her own thing the way when she was trained? Ever? It's the preacher's fault. I just wish he wouldn't say it like that. Or I wish he would have called me back. Or I wish he would have told me hi. You know, it, it's somebody else's fault. No, no, no. It's the enemy's fault and it's our fault because we allowed the word of the Lord to be distorted because we did not understand the word and we were caught up in the in the, being focused on the bait here because it was sweet and it was tantalizing and it looked good and it tasted good when we took a nibble and then a nibble was never enough. They used to say that. I think it was Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one. You might not remember that, but I do. And you know why? Because we moved to Singapore and that's the first thing I saw in the airport in Hawaii. That old Lay's potato chip. Some of you old people will remember. Had that old checkerboard with the yellow. I said, oh, Lay's potato chips. I can remember I was so dramatic. I was, I was about 10 years old. I got down on the airport. How disgusting. And kissed. No, I kissed the ground when we got off the plane. Yeah, we're in America. I kissed the ground. Like, what a dramatic, what a dramatic, patriotic kid. I am. I don't want to live in Singapore no more. I went to buy, Mama, buy me that bag of Lay's potato chips, man. I never thought I would eat Lay's potato chips could be so good. Yeah, the trap isn't seen. It's, it's camouflaged. He's got methodology, intellect to what he's doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The word advantage means to gain power over. The word devices means that there's intellect connected to what he's doing. And I just wanted to make that point. He's smart. He's tricky. He, he will convince your mind. You know, I, I told somebody in a story yesterday. I've just been witnessing to so many people. Like, I'm just feeling free again. I'm telling you, I'm feeling free again. People, you know, I told my sister a while back. I was saying that in the prayer room this morning. My sister... I can tell my older sister she's kind of softened up because she's fearful that she probably had had ruffled people's feathers through the years. And I told her recently, I said, let me just say this. In my opinion, you need to go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, let the Lord knock some of the rough edges off. But don't let the Lord take away the truth. I mean, don't let the enemy take away the truth. Amen. No, people need to hear the truth. Yes, and right. they're never going to always like it when they first hear it. But somebody has to tell the truth. We can't be so worried that we don't ever tell the truth, right? And, 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 you know, I just, I just want to say that uh, I've just been, been more free to let people know the truth. I don't want, I'm not going to sit here and live my life concerned that people aren't going to like me or that they're going to think I'm weird. Good. I am. I'm a peculiar person. Amen. That's what the word of the Lord says. Christians are peculiar people. The Lord will give us the right way to say it in the right time. <coughs> the enemy is trying to plan and his devices are methodical. And he's going to put that bait. Point number three. I just want you to know this. The point number three is search and surrender. See, the passage said this earlier when we got to verse three. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. I want to encourage you with that this morning because what it's describing is the fact that somebody's snared. 
and that the Lord's word is promising that he will deliver you from it. So even if you may feel snared right now or you may know a loved one that you feel like they're snared, I'm here to tell you that the Lord will deliver them. But when I said search and surrender, you see search and rescue is the Lord's business. Search and rescue is the Lord's mission. He's the only one that can come and find us and truly set us free. Right. But search and surrender. When he searches, we're the ones that have to surrender. Yeah. There's a part that the Christian plays. You do understand that. The finished work of the cross works. Amen. Jesus died to give us access to grace. Amen. Grace is more powerful than sin. Yeah. Grace is more powerful than the works of the enemy. Right. But our will is a powerful thing also. And when our will is broken, listen, I heard the first time I heard a preacher say that, you know, that, 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 that how, how was it worded? Your willpower isn't strong enough. I remember that. And when that preacher said that, boy, something rose up in my flesh. Because you know why? There's something ingrained in us, a spirit of religion that wants us to believe, to be deceived, that we can do it. Yeah. Man, if you can do it, Jesus didn't have to do it. That's right. And let me tell you something. Your willpower is not... Yeah, your willpower might be strong enough to prevent you from, I mean, I'm just using something crazy, from, from, you know, snorting cocaine wherever you are. Let's say you used to do that, and you've completely delivered from it. But there's something somewhere that the enemy is going to find the right piece of paper. And he's going to put that thing there, and he's never going to quit. And your willpower is not going to be strong enough to overcome this. Right. Right. You're going to need the power of the Lord. Amen. Right. You're going to need the power and the grace of God. And if you're unwilling to surrender in that area of your life, the Holy Spirit is not going to break your free will. Oh, he will, he will create situations and circumstances. He will put you in the midst of situations to slowly allow you to come to a breaking point. He is an orchestrator of events like that. But he's not going to transgress the free will that he gave you. He gave you a free will and he wants you to take that free will and give it back to him. That's the whole concept of faith. That's the whole concept of surrendering to God. Amen. He will show up and do it suddenly. He will allow you to be in the midst of darkness, trapped in the midst of the woods, darkness setting in, the mosquitoes biting you. And at the last moment of time, he will swoop in. He will release the trap. He will show you the way out of the woods. And he would, like the psalmist David said, he put me in an open and a large place. That's the opposite of being confined. That's like being in a big old green field and pastures and the sheep just calmly uh, Herding, uh, grazing in the field. It's a big wide open space. It's freedom and it's liberty. And whenever God uh, allows that freedom to take place, your heart will be overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Has that ever happened to you, Christian? Yeah. I hope it has. At least if it's not, if it hasn't happened that big, I hope it's at least happened in some small ways yeah. where the Lord would flood your heart for a moment with grace. And that feeling how you know that he's real and that he's speaking yeah. to you and that there's hope. Amen. Because the enemy wants to convince you of something different. Yeah. Search and surrender. Surely he will deliver you to rescue, to take out. God's business is the search and rescue. The, if the singers and musicians could come. God's business is search and rescue. Our business is to search and to surrender. Search for God. Search for his word. Yeah. He promises to deliver, but the believer has responsibility to participate with him. Remember how I've been using this word a lot lately? Uh, I don't even know how to work this thing. I've been using this word a lot lately. <coughs> and this is this is the word. Koinonia. The word means, it's, it's how we translate communion. It's how we translate <coughs> fellowship. I use the, I've been using the word a lot lately in the Greek. That's what it means. It means communion. It means fellowship. It also means joint participation. There's a place in the life of the believer, and I think it's so important that we understand this, that we joint participate with the Lord, that we agree with him according to his word, that his word is right, and our ways are wrong, and his ways are right. And by faith, we surrender. Sometimes it starts with a, with a prayer where we're like, Lord, I've been wrong. You're right. Homologia, that's another Greek word. Say the same. I say the same as you, Lord. I didn't know, but now I know your word revealed it to me. I, I want to say the same that you said. Mm -hmm. 
I want to join participate yes, Lord. Lord. Yes. I've been in a trap either I've been in a trap or my family members been in somebody's been in a trap but we need deliverance Lord deliverance amen I want to encourage you with that the way that we're going to be able to be delivered is we've got to put time into the word did you hear me Christian Yep. Amen. We gotta, we gotta know the word. We gotta study it. it, 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 it we, we gotta love it, Lord. And if you don't feel like you love it right now, let's pray together. Lord, give us a love for your word. Yes. Give us a desire to study your word, to read your word, even if we just start off small. Yeah. Give me a paragraph a day, Lord. Help me. Not, not as a work. I, 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 I want to believe in your work, Lord. Yes. That's what Jesus told the religious leaders. They said, "What works must we do to see the kingdom of God?" He said, "You work the work of." The, of the, 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 of God is to believe in the one whom he sent. The work of the Christian is, is the work of faith. To believe. Hallelujah. In Jesus. And what he did. Teach us, oh Lord. Now listen, I want to encourage you this morning. You know, if you're going through something, uh, we're all going through something. Amen. I want to encourage you. The altars are open. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to close this service out with some worship. And if you need prayer, the altars are open. If not, then listen, just tell Jesus how much you love him before you leave this morning. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.